The mission of Harvard College has been for almost 400 years now to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. And we do this through our belief in what we call the transformative power of a liberal arts and science education. And for us, it begins with the intellectual transformation, the social transformation, and the personal transformation. Uh, I'll come back to what, what I think each of those mean, but particularly spend time on the intellectual a little bit and the social, um, because I think the context has changed. So while the purpose that you so eloquently pointed out for college, I think, has stayed the same, I think the context in which we're operating has changed in, 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 in many ways. And obviously, COVID um, brought that to the fore. It was a very humbling experience for um, our institutions and particularly Harvard. Um, and I think it's a humbling you know, experience for all of us as a global society. We know that I think something like um, 6 million people have already passed away from COVID and hundreds of millions have had it and, and became ill. And so um, I also know that you know, our students lost time. Right? And time is not an infinite resource. It's not something you can save or bank or uh, use for another day. And that impact also was compounded by social isolation um, and educational outcomes that we, I, I think will take us many years to understand um, as they play out. And you know, on the other side of what COVID also brought, it, it did kind of halt the machinery a little bit or slowed it down pretty um, incredibly, which gave us, I think, a chance to look at it a kind of point of arrival in society and maybe a point of arrival as a higher education institution. Um, and, you know, uh, my colleague, Nicholas Christakis, who's a fellow sociologist and also a, a medical doctor, he used to be here, he's at Yale now, um, he wrote a book on pandemics and he pointed that, you know, pandemics are disruptive in very unique ways, unlike some other social events in, the, in that they're punctuated, uh, but they set in motion events whose causality can only be established through hindsight, not foresight. And I think that's a, so I also tread very cautiously to think about like what COVID meant for higher education. Um, but I think we can point to some things that we saw um, in, in this motion, in, in this area, which was that we weren't just in a health crisis. Uh, we were in a social crisis, um, polarization, inequality, um, justice, all of these things that literally threaten our democracy uh, in this nation. Um, and I think they also, you know, Nicholas also points out another thing is that pandemics bring out both the best in humanity and the worst in humanity. I think we saw examples of selfishness and a lack of respect, but we also saw like an embrace of people and neighbors and in particular uh, our essential workers and how critical they are to the daily functioning of our society. Um, and I think COVID highlighted how important and I think critical a residential um, liberal arts and sciences education is at this moment, but also the danger and challenges that I think it faces uh, in today's world. And um, so for the first one, you know, I think it's on around the intellectual transformation. So when I talk about, we talk about the intellectual transformation at the college, it's the goal is to develop an independent mind, to learn to think for oneself, to appreciate the role of reason and evidence, to search for veritas, the truth, but also recognize that the truth is not easily attained. Um, it has to be discovered, uncovered, discerned. And moreover, it requires a sort of stance of humility um, because things that we were so certain to be true at one point turn out to be more contingent or complex or not even true at all. Um, and I think that part of what you know education teaches us is that part of how we learn to think for ourselves is through dialogue and exposure to different perspectives and different ways of thinking. All of the things that you described that your interview um, um, subjects you know, revealed. Um, and I think one of the things you also learn is that not everybody's always interested in the search for truth. Uh, that the search of truth, which is a human activity, also exists among other human activities, including the search for dominance and power. Um, and, and so we have to also recognize this is not an easily uh, done thing. It doesn't make it any less valid, but I think understanding the complexities of that um, um, means that, you know, that search for the accuracy of the world is, is more difficult. And um, I think the COVID context is one thing that it really revealed is the role of social media uh, in many ways and how it interplays with education and the search for truth. Um, I think in particular, um, and I think many of our students and faculty and all of us are subject to it, is that our attention has increasingly been turned into a commodity. Um, it is something that's manipulated and it is bought and sold. Um, and the things that started out for us, and I just saw this yesterday with a, there was an article about another app that's out that you know students are using 
um, uh, I think side chat, side, did I get that right? Okay, right, so these things always start out, and I, you know, I'm a tech person, I worked in tech for, uh, in my starting companies, um, but you know, um, they start out as sort of humorous distractions, um, and, and I think as we saw during COVID, whether it was streaming a video or watching some short videos or um, that these human distractions are kind of actually organized by algorithms, which then turn into habits. Um, the habits become reflexes and the reflexes become addictions, yeah. right? And that's actually what the business model is. And I'm a professor at the business school, so I have no, uh, you know, I'm a private in the capitalist army. Um, but it's funny to me the terminology that's used increasingly as part of business plans. Uh, terminology we used to associate with chronic diseases, uh, binging, addiction, um, you know, virality, <laughs> having something go become viral, um, and that this is like now endemic to a business plan, which is this is the goal, is to actually to create binging, addiction, and make something viral. And I think it's just something that should give us some pause because these are choices that have been made. It's a system in which it could have broadened us, broadened our exposure to ideas, broadened our exposure to other different perspectives, and instead actually it's had the opposite, which is the narrowing function. And it is a machinery wired to, to do that and programmed to do that. And it's done so in a way that you don't even have a human agent anymore uh, that's doing it, right? There's no sort of moral compass of somebody making a decision about where they're directing behavior. There's an algorithm that's sort of self-learning and um, in, in, in doing this. And I think, um, again, you know, uh, this steady drip of dopamine and, you know, exciting certain parts of our emotional state, um, uh, you know, again, very understandable, but I think this has not been an innocent exercise. Um, and when you think about education in this context, especially our own education model, it makes us vulnerable uh, in many ways, where we prefer outrage over a nuanced discussion and that the rage itself uh, is sort of seen as entertainment. And I think so we can see this, and I think the impact this has on education is that the context makes discussion of differences and points of view and nuanced conversation much harder, which is essentially what educational institutions do. And it makes it harder because in many ways when I've uh, you know, talked to students, about this, they are so fearful about having certain kinds of discussion that it enforces a kind of conformity of thinking. And this conformity shows up in two different ways. One is a kind of fear of being labeled some kind of ist of some type. And as a result, people don't say what they really believe and outwardly they look like there's agreement. Now, inwardly, when there's a distance between how you express yourself outward and inward, the, what the result is often a dissonance, but also a sense of shame. Mm -hmm. um, because you feel like, why can't this exterior and my interior be more aligned and closer to my, my true self? Or the flip side is that, that if you're a person who's like const, you know, constitutionally in, incapable of like going along with that, you're ostracized. And now you're outside, and now you also feel a sense of shame, or you are shamed. Mm -hmm. And I think both of those things, are, those are not healthy places for human beings to be, you know, to be, and, you know, we were, as I was saying at dinner, I, I'm, I'm kind of, my wife would describe me as Max Weber's, you know, religiously unmusical. Um, but I know that those feelings really are at the essence of human dignity. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the ability to express oneself is so essential to human dignity. You don't know who you are until you can express yourself. The expressive act is one in which one discovers oneself. And so if going back to the you know, quotes that you read, if part of what college does is give you the apparatus and the tools to construct oneself in an intentional way to become the person, first figure, figure out who you are before the world told you who you were, but also to figure out who you want to be, and you can't engage in that kind of exploratory space, I think it does present a significant kind of challenge. Um, I think, you know, part of how we can, you know, meet the challenges of that is I think our residential system, which was something that I think all of us painfully felt the absence of during, um, which is that in those spaces, you can take off the sort of mask of performativity, uh, especially if you develop good relationships with people, healthy, respectful relationships that are sort of built on trust and respect. 
in which you can share your thoughts, in which you can be vulnerable about your thoughts. Because I think in those kind of conversations, when one is vulnerable, it often creates a space for somebody else to be vulnerable. And out of that shared humanity comes dialogue and alternative possibilities for the future. But that is really hard to do if constantly you feel you're under the gaze of a kind of judgment of the herd. I mean, the herd, yeah, the, the herd's judgment. And it's kind of, you know, ever present. I, I mean, I used to like watch the Lord of the Rings. It was like this eyeball on top <laughs> of this mountain that like, you know, like, is that the way we have, we all have to kind of like hide from that? And it, that, that, that gaze, I think, actually of, of, of the crowd um, inhibits and it feels ever present and more omnipresent um, everywhere. And I think what we have to do, again, getting to the same goals is how do we create spaces for both recognizing, you know, our vulnerabilities, recognizing our multiple identities, recognizing that we also are bundles of believing A and B doesn't necessarily mean you also believe D and E, um, and that you're still wondering about C. Um, and not to be able to engage in that and have people assume all of that, I think really kind of inhibits the potential of the transformative power of our education. So.